Good morning, good morning, good morning. How are you? Oh, it's a gorgeous day. It is a gorgeous day. Just wash my hair. My hair is about to... Uh, see all those piles of ash over there? That's all the... Uh, that's all the bonfires, the big bonfires. They burnt all the trees yesterday. Oh my goodness. There's a lot of ash. I don't know what they're going to do with it. When we have big bonfires on my land, we uh, it just sort of blows away, you know. Which is jolly useful. So, what should we talk about today? What stunning aspect of being a general dental practitioner, A, haven't we covered, and B, constitutes a cogent and fairly well self-contained discussion of a single topic. Oh, how about coming round blind corners and finding bin men? Talking of which, the bin men didn't pick up my bins last week. They changed all the days. Well, they said they changed all the rotors. And then, uh, <clears throat> but they didn't. They gave us the same day back. You know, they said, oh, we're going to change a day. And then they said, no, just it's exactly the same day. And then, uh, and then the uh, rubbish didn't get picked up. So the only thing that had changed as a result of the rotor is that uh, they made it less efficient. But it's usually more complicated than that because the bin men usually go out of their way to make sure that it's less efficient. They like to. Uh, they go on a go slow on a day when anything changes because they can take advantage of it, they can arbitrage it they can use it to say that they're overworked, underpaid they can use it to uh, uh, take advantage of the chaos produced to uh, put in claims for overtime and stuff like that that's a classic case of uh, being an employer and having a workforce that's working against you yeah I mean don't forget that time when uh, they put my bin in the back of the bin lorry and the lid came off and then they put it back with uh, empty with no lid and uh, I said the bin men have broken my bin and the council wrote to the bin men and said you've broken Mr Watson's bin and they said no it was he'd stuffed it he'd overfilled it the lid was sticking up as a result it got broke it's not our fault you know Mr. Watson can buy another bin for his pains and uh, fortunately it was all on CCTV so I had them I didn't I didn't have them on putting it in the back of the lorry so I don't know why it broke but uh, which the bloke from the council I contacted it was very curious about how it had come off because I'm sure it, it doesn't it is a fault with the uh, the technique or the bin lorries or the bins or something uh, which will have to remain uh, unanswered but it was quite clear that it, the bin wasn't over full the lid was fully down and everything and so they got shown up as uh, liars honest frauds, you know, crooks basically crooks and uh, liars and uh, self-serving uh, fraudsters and uh, so they had to buy me a new bin so which the council was happy about because the council I think was pleased that they had the evidence to give to the bin people that they'd broken the bin and uh, I, I assume they only sent them the video evidence after they'd replied saying giving the stock reply that that's not my fault I wasn't there that day that's not my signature and you know if it's about that broken window I don't know anything about it so. but um, you don't really you know, you shouldn't really uh, get to that. that. That's a very sort of, um, you know, there's no end of 50 comedies, 50s comedies, black and white comedies about, from the Ealing Studios about companies that are at war with the workforce, you know, where the management are 
uh, trying to get something done and the uh, and the workforce are trying to make sure that the exact opposite happens and that they, they don't have to do any work um, it's just a fault of the I think it's a big fault of the way that we're paid in this country that you know you're either paid on a results basis mainly if you're self-employed uh, a small business owner or the director of a limited company or something or if you're just paid a, a fixed number of pounds per hour and uh, in which case obviously it's in your incentive to make sure that very little gets done or, or as little as possible gets done you know uh, it, and it's difficult I don't I think you know this teleocracy uh, thing I was talking about management by a shared purpose I think uh, and giving people a certain measure of um, autonomy in terms of uh, purchasing and directing their own hours directing their own work etc uh, does help even to an hourly paid employee because uh, it gives them a sort of sense of ownership and a sense of stake in their own uh, work and as a result they tend to have more of a mentality that they're trying to work towards their goals uh, which as long as they're in line with the business goals are is fine isn't it uh, whereas um, you know someone who's literally just told where to report at what time and what to do um, uh, really doesn't feel like they're working towards their goals at all you know so that would be my solution and certainly in a small firm uh, it works like that and some of the other firms bigger firms that have tried something like that some sort of share uh, employee share ownership of you know the John Lewis partnerships which I have to say are uh, characterized by their scarcity you know they are not you know they're, they're um, rare um, so it's all very well saying they have a better business model or But not not so good that everybody copies them, you know. And it's the same with like the NHS. Everyone says, "Oh, the NHS is brilliant." It's not so brilliant that any other countries copied it. Uh, so how you know how brilliant can it be if, if people look at it and say, "No, I don't want to do it that way." And certainly, John Lewis and uh, these owner the cooperatives have. Um, well, I'd say, with the possible exception of the cooperative. Uh, group and in certainly in the areas of uh, funeral provision and uh, food distribution and, and retail, uh, they they seem to be doing okay. But um, I don't know to what extent that's because they are in the, uh, the those industries where you know everybody eats and everybody dies, you know. Whereas not everybody wants a, a, a top-notch kettle from John Lewis or a, <laughs> or a DAB radio, you know. So uh, anyway, so where's the dental in all this? Well, there's a bit of there's a bit about tidiocracy and stuff like that. Um, we've got a particular problem at the moment. Who's the hygienist? Our hygienist fell over. She was trying to carry too much up some stairs. Fell over and broke her wrist. Her left radius, which is the you know the wrist bone, and uh, it's a comminuted fracture. So for those of you who weren't paying attention in anatomy, a comminuted fracture is where it's not a clean fracture. You get a there's a third triangle of bone that gets snapped out of the where it's broken and so that piece of bone has to uh, weld itself back on or, or uh, get broken down by the osteoblasts bearing in mind it hasn't got a blood supply from either end it's unlikely that it will uh, re uh, um, it's most likely it will die off and then and require to be resorbed and so Comminuted fractures are complicated uh, and slow to heal. And so it's been in this case, you know, the initial six to eight weeks turned into 10 to 12 weeks and, and now it's going into, 
I don't know, probably 20 to 26 weeks. Let me just concentrate on the junction of death. There we go. Oh, I don't know who that is. I think that's my daughter by the look of it. Oh, hey, yeah, it's my daughter. She's taking the kids to school. So, yeah, so so we're one hygienist down, you know, and um, hygienist services are a funny, they're a funny thing because um, <laughs> I'll cut all this out. <laughs> but uh, no, no, we're um, so we're one hygienist down, and uh, you know, let, let me just go through the dental problems that that, that causes. Right, first of all, uh, there are you will have some patients that have come to your surgery specifically because you've got a hygienist. Yeah. And this is, and then it's just an extension of the second problem, which is that, um, oh, hang on. What are you doing? <laughs> are you following me? <laughs> Stop following me. What does he say? You're a big <laughs> right. Tell him I'm going to get him. Oh, well, there you go. There's a chance encounter. They're going that way. I'm going this way. Oh, yeah, sorry about that. It's just having a quick shout to my family. So, um, yeah, so you have got, right, this ridiculous situation where dentists are very highly trained in periodontal departments up and down the country to do the most advanced perio, which, you know, in my, in the 70s included, I don't know when it includes now, but in the 70s included every aspect of periodontal rehabilitation. Right the way through from basic plaque control, scaling, root planing, uh, under local anaesthetic, uh, flap surgery, apically repositioned flaps, uh, gingivectomies, etc., etc. Right, and then you've got hygienists who are also, to be fair, for the most part, trained in periodontal departments uh, to do a subset of that, a subset, right, which is basically uh, plaque control, um, scaling root planing, under local anaesthetic if they've got the LA certificate, certainly not gum surgery, uh, uh, gingivectomies or apically repositioned flaps or apicectomies or, or anything like that, okay? So, so you've got a, like, <laughs> you've got a, a, a hygienist is basically a process worker, okay? Now if you're a hygienist, I'm going to say a lot of things that are going to deeply be deeply hurtful to you, so you might as well tune away now. But uh, patients, uh, when they come along, and and they do it very badly, I've got to, I've got to say this, I've got to say this, okay? And I do genuinely believe this. I think that uh, hygienists, for the most part, farm their patients, uh, just uh, like doing doing the basic unit of work, which is the scale and polish, uh, year after year, month after month, decade after decade. And we very frequently get patients who come and see us and, uh, you know, whose uh, plaque control is poor, whose uh, gum condition is poor, and who um, say, I have been to see the hygienist every single, every single six months, you know, since I was a child, and I can't understand why my, my, my 
gums are in such a poor. They always tell me my gums are in a terrible state. And if I, you know, and they say, uh, do you brush twice a day? And I say yes. And they say, well, you're obviously not using the right brush. So then I use the brush they recommend. And so then they say, well, uh, perhaps you need an electric, you, you need an electric brush. So then I buy 100 quid on an electric brush, or 200 pounds sometimes. And then when I go back, they say, oh, you're, you know, you're still getting scale on your teeth. Do you brush your teeth twice a day? Yes. Are you using an electric brush? Yes. Did, you know, which you bought from reception. Did you, um, are you using uh, uh, interspace brushes, you know, which are pushed very hard by companies like TP, sending out free samples, wanting to get every patient to use TP brushes, which, which do, in my opinion, you know, are useful in one in a million cases, uh, but in 999 out of the other million, they uh, just create holes in between the teeth. And in very severe cases, uh, uh, abrade the dentine away. So you, so you literally get grooves in between the teeth if the patients get two. So they create the very problem that they're touted to solve. So, you know, do hygienists sit down with patients and watch them brush for the most part? No. Do hygienists sit down with patients and show them how to chew up a disclosing tablet or disclose the plaque on their teeth so they can see what the problem is, they can see where it is they can see what's the best way to get rid of it. They can see when it's been, it's been got rid of, you know. <laughs> do they do that? No. They just do a scale and polish, whatever, 49 quid, thank you very much, see you again in six months time. Now, the patients, on the other hand, you, you, they've got a preference for hygienists over dentists. So they've got a preference, to be blunt, for process workers over uh, the experts, okay? And, and, and at this point, a lot of hygienists are going to say, no, we're the experts on hygiene, we're, the, we're, trained, we're fully trained on hygiene. You're not, the most dentists are useless at scaling and polishes, most dentists don't have the first clue about gums, blah, blah, blah. And really, I think, if you're, the, if you're a sort of hygienist that says that, I think you need to take a long, hard look at your profession, you know? Because you're, you have to ask yourself, how much of an impact you're making on the oral hygiene of your patients. Uh, and I would say for the most part, probably not an awful lot. You're just farming scales and polishes. And uh, you're doing it, you're not even doing it in accordance with the regulations. Because I think for the most part, uh, and I know for a fact that uh, all NHS patients are entitled to have all the periodontal treatment that is necessary to secure and maintain their oral health on the National Health Service. And basically, if I remember correctly, it's included in a band one course of treatment. I think band one is a checkup, x-rays, and if necessary, a scale and polish. Now, you're not telling me that for what uh, the, the, uh, the average NHS dentist is paid for a band one course of treatment, which is, I don't know, is it would have been about 25 quid. I don't know why I'm, I'm in the right ballpark there. You're not telling me that they're going to... Uh, the hygienist is seeing those patients. Uh, they're not. And the dentist is not seeing them either. The dentist is sending them to the hygienist and telling them that they've got to go to the hygienist privately. Now, how can they... Uh, how can they perpetrate such a fraud on the NHS? As such as saying that something that should be included in the band A at no extra charge can only be done by the hygienist at a cost of 49 quid. Whether you're exempt or not, it doesn't make any difference, you still get charged 49 quid because it's done privately. And the answer is that they say that the, um, the hygienist can do things that can't be done under the band A scheme. So in other words, they're saying, look, you know, you can, I will, they, they don't even say, I could scale or polish your teeth, but I think you will probably prefer to see the hygienist because uh, from your perspective, you'll get better value for money. Now, <coughs> certainly they're not allowed to imply that that better value for money comes from a, of an improved clinical result. The actual clinical result is, um, should to all intents and purposes be the same, whichever way they choose. But the patients are very frequently, in fact, almost always not offered the option. In other words, they're just told that they've had their checkup, they don't need x-rays, and they need to, but they do need to go and see the hygienist, which they know 
is only available privately. Or they think, they think he's only available. They've been led to believe he's only available privately. And any patient, you know, is entitled to just stay in a chair and say, you know, I don't want to pay to have the hygienist do it. It cost me 49 quid. I'm entitled to have this done on the NHS. So either, if you don't want to book me in with the hygienist, which they don't, obviously, because they're going to get, like, <laughs> no money, and they're going to have to pay the hygienist 25 quid or whatever to do the scale and polish, uh, uh, then, you know, they, they, they won't send you to see the hygienist just because you, on the NHS, uh, basically, you just have to sit in a chair and say, well, in that case, you, you better get on with it because, you know, you're obliged to do this work. Well, there is still, of course, uh, uh, a pull, a, a requirement, you know, a demand from the patients to see hygienists, even though they are, to my, to my mind, much less effective and, and only do a subset of what a dentist could do. And this irks me a bit because obviously, it's a, you know, when you're hygienist off and you say, look, you know, I can do you, I can do your scale and polish, or would you rather wait two months until the hygienist comes back? And they say, oh, I'd rather wait two months till the hygienist come back. <laughs> Which is a bit like <laughs> someone wanting their ceiling painted and going to Leonardo da de Vinci and saying, uh, have you got someone who can paint my ceiling? And Leonardo da Vinci said, well, I can do it for you. Or if you like, uh, I've got a couple of uh, blokes who just do, uh, you know, fill in, fill in the edges for me. <laughs> <laughs> who, but they, they're not here at the moment, they'll be back in a couple of months, just a couple of jobbing painters, would you rather they did it? And they say, oh, well, I'll, thank you very much to Da Vinci, I'll, I'll wait two months for the jobbing painters. <laughs> so, but you can't, but <clears throat> to understand this, you have to get behind the mentality of the patients, which is, and understand that the service that the hygienist provides, and the service that the hygienist provides is, basically very similar to the service that a woman gets when she goes along and gets her hair done. And as a man, I do admit that, you know, men will have a lot of trouble understanding this. Um, if I want to get my hair cut, I, I do it, I get it, I want to get in, I want to get it cut, I want to get it out again, I want it to cost as little as possible, I want it to be done as quickly as possible, and providing it's, it's done to a reasonable standard, that's, it's just a job. Whereas uh, that when a woman gets her hair cut, it's not a job, it's an experience. And when someone comes to see the hygienist, it's not a job, it's just an experience. But with me, it's just a job. They know if they come to see me to get their teeth scaled, it will just be a job. They'll get it done, they'll get it done in the least amount of time possible, and uh, and uh, it'll, be, it'll be very functional, very, uh, and very based around clinical um, outcomes, clinical health, um, 100% of the scale removed and not at all to do with pampering or uh, having a chat about how the children are getting on at school, you know, and that sort of thing. So that's what you're selling really with a hygienist is you're, you're selling an experience. And unfortunately, uh, I mean, what, what we can do, me and uh, Mrs. W, the hygienist, Mrs. Angry, she... Um, obviously it's very in tune with me in terms of clinical outcomes and so now we have got rid of hygienists in the past who were insisted insisted on doing things in a way which was perhaps more in tune with uh, modern uh, clinical teaching on uh, you know and modern um, hygiene methods but were, were, were was much less effective you know was much, and I would pit my worst 10 patients in terms of periodontal treatment uh, up against any dentist 10 best, and I would win that contest. And I don't have time to retrain a hygienist who's just come out of dental school. I honestly don't. Hello. Oh, that's my quarter to nine patient. I say, I better, I better say goodbye and uh, I'll talk to you later. Bye.